Great. Good morning. Uh, this is Friday, April 16th. It's 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and we are, after a long night of other debate, we are turning our attention this morning again to S3, uh, which we have uh, had some witnesses for in some committee discussion. Uh, we have with us this morning Wilda White from Mad Freedom, who requested to be heard, and I'm happy to have her join us here this morning. Uh, I, I should say that um, I, I, have, I have had some, so Will, I wanted to say, and I hadn't gotten a chance because of everything that was going on yesterday to be in touch, but I've had some conversation with uh, the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and so I think that there is, so um, we, we want to hear your testimony and we have not had that chance yet, but uh, and I'm hoping that some of what you've testified to already in the Judiciary Committee may already be influencing a draft that they're working on as well. So uh, I'm wanting us to focus on sections five and section six this morning, which is the areas that we're primarily uh, looking at. So with that, uh, welcome and introduce yourself, please. And then uh, we'll hear your testimony. Thank you, Chair Lippert. Uh, good morning, uh, House Healthcare Committee. My name is Wilda White. I am uh, the founder of an organization called Mad Freedom. Uh, and I started this organization because um, of my own personal experiences with discrimination and oppression uh, against me based on my having um, a diagnosis of a severe mental illness. Um, you know, this diagnosis came very late in my life. And so for, for, for the majority of my life, I enjoyed all the privileges of a person who was deemed sane by society. But suddenly, um, you know, kind of after practicing law and achieving very much in my life, I could no longer even be employed. Um, and I, I give you that background because the reason I wanted to speak on this, um, this bill this morning is because I felt in listening to the testimony, particularly in the House Healthcare Committee, um, that the voice of people who actually have been diagnosed or experienced um, uh, symptoms that our society designates as mental illness uh, their voices have been silenced here or, or erased or, or, or not considered. Um, and because the mission of MAD Freedom is to, um, to, to secure political power to end this discrimination and oppression of people um, based on their perceived mental state, um, because that is our mission, I felt compelled um, to bring that voice into um, this, this committee room. This is not a bill that I would really want to run to um, speak on, uh, principally because, you know, people who have mental illnesses are always perceived as dangerous, always perceived as violent. Um, when the vast majority of us uh, have no violent history, have you know, have no dangerous history, um, yet like other uh, groups who are numerical minorities, we are always defined by the. The, the 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 minority within us. Um, majority groups don't don't get um, uh, labeled with that. You know, although most men, most people who commit rapes are men. Men are not considered rapists. However, um, you know, when a person who has a mental illness also um, commits a violent crime, suddenly all people with a mental illness um, are are violent. So my testimony here is. Um, to provide a voice for those of us who are, uh, who are not violent, uh, who, whose mental illnesses have not caused them to be violent, uh, but who nonetheless are, 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 are uh, considered violent or uh, bear the brunt of those attitudes in our society. So I understand that. And so I also want to say that I come to this as an, as an attorney uh, also, as somebody who has experienced a long period of psychosis and mania, uh, also as a person who was a uh, the guardian, the legal guardian of a brother who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, who also uh, was involved in the criminal justice system, um, and also as someone who was also a victim of a, of a violent crime, a sexual assault. Uh, and so I feel like I can uh, understand kind of many, if not all, the tensions in this bill. Um, but, but many of those other voices have been heard and I feel the voice of people who um, have mental illnesses have not been heard. So I understand that you're only taking up 
um, really considering section five and six of this bill. Uh, but I feel like I need to go through, not in painstaking detail, but uh, other parts of the bill because they inform my comments on uh, particularly section six of the bill. I won't be discussing section five of the bill. Um, so um, overall, um, the, uh, I, I think just because in the, just because I want to get through this quickly, I don't want to belabor this. I know you've all been up late, as have I, um, because you know when you're on the floor, a lot of us citizens are actually watching too. So, um, <laughs> so we're all tired, and so I am going to try to uh, walk through this um, as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. So, um, I, I first want to just uh, mention in um, the, the first section, section one. Um, scope of scope of examination, um, and, and particularly looking at subsection C one. It's on page one, and it's the provision of the bill that um, that says who the report goes to after someone's competency or sanity has been examined, and who's excluded, um, and who that report goes to is actually the person who that report is about. Um, and, and that is um, the, that person is identified as the respondent in this bill. And so I testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee that the respondent um, should be listed as a person who receives a copy of the report. Um, and if you read that bill, it says that the report shall be sent to the state's attorney, to the respondent's attorney, if the respondent is represented by counsel and to the commissioner of, of uh, mental health. And um, once again, here the respondent has been excluded. And I wanna say, I wanna tell you that um, oftentimes in a competency examination, the respondent or the defendant does not agree with their attorney about their competency because uh, most defendants do not want to be adjudicated incompetent. Uh, anyone who's been through the mental health system does not wanna go through the mental health system again. Um, you are punished more harshly um, if you have both a criminal charge and you've been uh, and you have a mental illness, and so we're always striving not to be adjudicated incompetent. Um, in fact, I, I faced a civil commitment hearing myself when I was in California, and after interviewing the the lawyer who was assigned to represent me, I decided to represent myself, and I did so successfully. Um, so, uh, just as a matter of recognizing the human dignity of a person. Uh, who's a defendant, I feel like they should be provided a copy of this report. Um, and also because some defendants um, want, want can, can better assist their attorneys if they understand what's in that report. And then sometimes relationships between attorneys and clients are not good, particularly when the, client, the attorney wants to uh, challenge someone's competency, but the defendant doesn't. Um, and then I wanna move on to, um, page two, uh, the first paragraph, paragraph two. Um, this is another area where um, I feel that the way the bill is written, it disadvantages uh, a, a person uh, with a mental illness. Because in this, um, in this paragraph, um, it says, and I'm looking at the last sentence of the uh, of subsection two on page two of the bill. And it reads, in such cases, the examination of the person's sanity shall be only undertaken if the psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial. So I testified in the Senate, excuse me, in the House Judiciary Committee that if a person is undergoing a competency exam and the attorney knows that they're going to be raised in the insanity defense, that it's in the best interest of the defendant and justice to allow the examiner to examine both sanity and competence at the same time, because if the person is adjudicated incompetent, there could be a long delay before they ever get to trial and evidence could be lost um, because of that delay. Um, I was a person who, like I said, experienced psychosis and mania for a long period of time but after it was over, um, no one could tell that I had been incompetent and no one could believe um, that I had been psychotic or, or manic. 
And all of my friends who were witness to that, their memories faded. There was also a trial after, I had a civil trial following my period of incompetency, excuse me, my period of psychosis. And many of the witnesses couldn't remember um, things that had happened when I was psychotic. And so um, I was less able to present my case to trial. You heard some testimony yesterday from, I think it was yesterday or maybe a couple of days ago from Dr. Ravna, who testified that the American Bar Association and the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law um, said that it was their industry standard not to do these two examinations at the same time. Uh, and the lawyer in me caused me to go and look at exactly what the American Bar Association said and exactly what the Academy of uh, American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law says, and they do not say uh, what the testimony said. Um, what the American Bar Association says is the examination should not be done at the same time unless the defendant requests that they be done at the same time or unless a court orders based on good cause shown. The American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law borrows the American Bar Association's recommendation and says that these should not be done at the same time unless the defendant requests and unless the court orders. And they say the reason they shouldn't be done at the same time is because sometimes if somebody is in a incompetency examination, they may reveal information um, that is incriminating and some states don't have laws that protect a defendant from giving incriminating information during a competency exam. Vermont is not one of those jurisdictions. In Vermont, we have a statute that explicitly says you can't um, use anything that a person says in an incompetency exam against them. So in this case, um, there's no reason in Vermont why those examinations cannot be done at the same time. Um, and so uh, to protect the interest of the defendant, it's really important that they have the ability to have those examinations done as soon as possible so as not to lose that evidence. Um, one of the things that was disturbing to me that when this bill has been discussed in both the Senate and the House um, Judiciary Committees is that everybody assumes that the person who's, on, who's been charged with the crime is guilty of that crime. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, like I told you, my brother was caught up in the uh, criminal justice system and he has a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia. Um, and he was charged with um, dealing um, crack cocaine out of his apartment. Uh, and it was the case that crack cocaine was being dealt out of his apartment, but he was not the dealer. Someone was taking advantage of him. He was arrested um, and you know, pleaded not guilty uh, because he, he, he did not even have the capability to sell crack cocaine. And so I want you to try to keep in mind that um, not everybody who's accused of a crime is guilty and not everybody who has a mental illness who's accused of a crime is guilty of that crime. And so that's why I say when we want to protect the rights of the defendants, people accused of crime, even those with a mental illness are entitled to the presumption of innocence. Um, and um, so when you when you write a when you write a bill that takes away the right of a person to preserve evidence, you, you really do take away their right to defend themselves at trial. Um, and then um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to, I'll, I'll jump to um, in the interest of time is the um, provision on page. Um, it begins on page six and goes to page seven. Um, it's on page seven, it's subsection J, which um, would change the current law to allow the prosecution to order uh, an examination of a person's competency if they didn't like the results of the court ordered um, examination. Um, and, and this is an area that um, really allows someone to basically shop for an opinion that they like. And I feel like it really threatens the integrity of the judiciary. Um, but more importantly to people who have mental illnesses, um, competency is an area that is really um, subject to abuse. Um, there are much evident, much law review articles written uh, in my profession, my legal profession, there's much discussion about how prosecutors oftentimes um, use a competency assessment to um, 
shuttle somebody into the civil commitment um, uh, system because uh, it, under the law, it, under United States kind of juris, uh, constitutional jurisprudence, a person who's been deemed incompetent to stand trial can be forcibly medicated. Even if, if they hadn't been deemed incompetent to stand trial, they couldn't be forcibly medicated because they understand the risk and benefits of the medication. And so there's a long line of uh, research and evidence that suggests that many prosecutors, when they feel like they can't make the case uh, on a criminal charge, but they find the person to be a nuisance, because maybe they've been arrested many times for disorderly conduct, for example, they will use a competency assessment to have the person declared incompetent and then shuttle them into the civil commitment system. And so this is a, a, a very concerning area for um, people who uh, might be caught up in the criminal justice system because of a mental illness, because um, none of us want to be forcibly medicated. Um, and it's something I thought I should bring to uh, your attention um, so you hear the other side of it. You know, I heard uh, Representative Peterson ask uh, a witness whether uh, that witness, whether that psychiatrist were, would be able to tell if somebody were faking it um, or malingering. And, you know, this, the psychiatrist, I don't know if gave you a direct answer, but I think tried to reassure you that they could. Um, and I want to tell you, I mean, there, there's a pretty famous study out there that um, showed that people were very able to... Um, uh, fake a mental illness and get admitted into a psychiatric hospital for the purposes of a study. And the only ones who knew that they were faking were the other people there with mental illnesses. Um, and so uh, this, this is an area where, where, where psychiatrists can be easily fooled. But what I'm trying to reassure you is, is that people who actually have mental illnesses are not interested um, in fooling psychiatrists to adjudicate them incompetent because they understand that they will be more harshly uh, punished in the uh, civil commitment uh, area than in the criminal justice system. Um, and, and, and then there's also, there's also in this bill a provision about uh, notifying people. I understand that that provision is going to come out upon the recommendation of everybody who's testified in the bill, so I'm not going to get into that today. It's been removed um, by both committees. Yeah. And so, so then that brings me then to the um, uh, section six of the bill, uh, which is the, the work group. And my easy, my, my first in kind of uh, simple uh, suggestion here is that right now the bill says that you should have one person on the work group who has a lived experience of mental illness. Um, I testified in, in the House Judiciary Committee, and I'm also going to testify here that um, one person, the voice of one person with a mental illness on this working group will never get heard. It will be very much silenced. Um, and also, the um, I, I often tell people, if you've met one person with a mental illness, you've met one person with a mental illness. Um, and so I'm suggesting that um, the number be increased to three. And also that the person not only just have a mental illness, but also have some experience with the criminal justice system and the civil and or the civil commitments system. Because I feel like uh, we are more than just informants in this process. We also are kind of epistemic agents. We also have knowledge um, that we can combine with our lived experience that will make the process um, more robust and richer. Um, and so I'm suggesting that that uh, be changed to to up the numbers and also up the up the uh, up the kind of price of admission to not only live the experience of mental illness but live the experience of mental illness along with some knowledge uh, of the criminal justice and uh, or and or civil uh, commitment system. I'm also asking, in addition to um, the, what's listed in the bill to study, um, that you know Vermont has a stated preference for uh, non-forced treatment. Um, and the competency restoration programs in other states often include forced um, drugging. Um, and because the legislature has previously said that it has a value, um, Vermont's value is to have voluntary treatment um, uh, that I feel like the bill should also state that 
in studying these competency restoration models, they should include models that don't include forced drugging. Um, and the other thing that I feel like the uh, working group needs to consider, in addition to balancing public safety and coordination of treatment, they also need to put in that balance that a person who's been adjudicated and competent to stand trial still has the presumption of innocence. Um, and they need to uh, balance that and, and weigh that when they're coming up with ways to um, improve or, or, or reform or change um, our criminal justice system. And I'm always wary of bills that direct a working group to study a particular system. And in this case, this bill directs the working group to study Connecticut system. And if you know anything about Connecticut is vastly different from Vermont. It's wealthier, it's more dense. They do not have uh, a, a outpatient forced medication program such as Vermont's order of non-hospitalization. And when I attended the psychiatry grand rounds a, a few weeks ago at the um, University of Vermont, um, I asked the presenter who was the doctor who testified before you why, why she was advocating. Excuse me, uh, is there somebody not on mute other than, yeah, apologies, let's continue. So this is, yeah, so I asked Dr. Rabner, you know, why are you, um, you know, suggesting that Vermont adopt this Connecticut Psychi Psychiatric Security Review Board, given all the differences between, particularly in wealth and density and population and in mental health laws, why are you, why are you advocating for this system? And she said, I'm not advocating for the system. I'm not saying that Vermont should adopt this program. I don't think they, they should. They may be able to learn things from it, but primarily I'm talking about it because that's the system I know best. And so um, I, I, I don't, I feel like because that system is so different from Vermont, um, Connecticut is so different from Vermont. And if we just ask the working group to concentrate on that, uh, we're going to come back with a recommendation for that um, that may not fit Vermont's values, it's, it's pocketbook uh, at all. Um, and so I, I would hope that this section could be less directive and, 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 and instead of telling them what to look into, perhaps telling them these are Vermont's values, these are Vermont's you know, constraints, um, these are the, the degrees of freedom and the degrees of less freedom, and we need a system that takes all that into account um, um, when we're designing a an appropriate forensic system um, for Vermont. And so I will um, leave, as I said, I will leave my testimony there and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Great. Well, I have a question, Wilda. Could, could you say something? I, I don't know if it's because I got distracted by what I, some ancillary sound. But would you say again, in term, what, what I'm taking from your last comment about the competency restoration models is that you, you would advocate for language that uh, ensures that any competency restoration models explored include a model that does not include, as you've put it, forced drugging. Uh, that, that that was the primary thing I heard, but but you you made some secondary, or I thought some secondary comment as well. And could you say that piece again? Because I, I that in terms of the, the consistent with Vermont's criminal justice, or I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't um, capture it. So if you would just say that again. No, so I don't know if you were talking. I don't know if you're referring to the arguments I made in in in, um, in support of asking this working group to make sure that they include competency restoration models that don't include forced drugging yes, um, because yes. Vermont in its, in its legislature yes. says we have a preference for non, yes. for, for, you know, for voluntary treatment. And so I don't want this, the, this working group to go away and only study competency restoration models that include forced drugging. Right. Um, and I want, and I thought it was important for the, this working group to remember that a person who's been adjudicated incompetent to stand trial, um, has the presumption of innocence, right? And so they shouldn't be treated more harshly than people with mental illnesses who um, are not involved in the criminal justice system. At least that's my value and that's how I, I interpret the, the presumption of innocence. Um, and I also don't think we want a two-tier um, 
uh, mental health system, you know, one that treats people, you know, more harshly. And when I say more harshly, I mean, um, doesn't um, recognize their rights of agency and dignity and, you know, the right to make decisions and um, for themselves. So that was that point there. Is that what you were referring to? Oops. I think my, my internet I think you just froze. I did my internet, I think my internet froze briefly, but I think I heard your, your clarification for me. Thank you. Other questions for, uh, for Wilda? Uh, I might just for the, yeah. So again, as I, I, I haven't been able to do a full review, but I think a number of your initial sec comments in the initial sections, I think are, are being integrated into a, a draft that the Judiciary Committee is contemplating in terms of uh, nevertheless, let's, I appreciate your, so are there other questions for Wilda? I'm looking across the screen, sorry. Okay, thank you. I, I thank really, you. I, I really appreciate your, uh, and, uh, and again, it's, it's an ongoing important experience, learning experience that we need to have all voices at the table all the time. Right, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me, uh, okay, give me, just give me a minute, please, if you would. So um, let me come back to this. So let's let's turn back to uh, some of what some committee discussion. Um, if we don't, we, we may not finish this this morning, but I think there may be time that later in the day for us to to come back. And given the hour last night, we're not going to press forward uh, in. Uh, in any way that doesn't make good sense. So um, what I'd like to do is we had done a preliminary draft, which I distributed uh, late yesterday, I believe. Uh, I don't know if folks got it. I think it was posted. And um, what I wanted to do is to open it up for questions, both about the draft and then, uh, because it tried to integrate suggestions from you know different the witnesses we heard today, and then uh, we want to also take into consideration the additional testimony that we've heard here this morning. So um, I think let me first just open it up broad, open up uh, for committee que for questions, open it broadly. And oh, I see that <laughs> at least on my screen, I see that Representative Donahue is. Uh, all right, let me just check. Oh, let me. I gotta turn this off. Yeah, you have two things going, and right. and I have to say, there is a, something a little bit creepy about seeing you with a dark figure standing over your shoulder. I had no <laughs> idea what that was initially. Oh, well, there's Janet. That's a lot friendlier voice or a lot friendlier person to see. <laughs> yeah, I've gone through like big crises, but very helpful people. Okay, I think I'm only on one device. I think I'm good now. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> yeah, and for those who, and it just occurs to me as I say a friendlier, I mean, they're both friendly, uh, but these are state house employees who many of you have not had the opportunity to meet yet. Uh, but one is, uh, I, think it, I think it's Chief Romei uh, yeah. of the Capitol Police Force and Janet Miller, who's the Sergeant at Arms for the state house. 
Both. And now they've left so I can take off my mask. Both of whom are, were disguised with their masks, but appropriately masked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I was just saying that uh, we're going to take maybe the next 20 minutes or so to go over this and not try to push to a conclusion prematurely if there's need to have further discussion. Uh, then we'll go to the floor and uh, anticipate we'll come back from the floor, hopefully, if not, we'll return to this on mo or, uh, Monday. Yeah, on Monday. No, no, on Tuesday. Uh, but, uh, but let's open it up for some uh, questions, if there are, uh, to the draft that was circulated. And then, uh, and also include uh, the testimony that we, we heard just now this morning. So, did, well, first of all, did people get a chance to look at it? Maybe this is even premature. And if it is, just please say so. I see Woody's shaking his head yes, meaning that it's premature. Yes. Okay. Well, then that's that answers the question because I, I don't want to ask you to try to discuss something which, given everything we've just done in terms of hours and the lateness of distributing a draft. Uh, so here's, I have a different suggestion. How about if we do, how about if we adjourn our committee this morning and give people this opportunity uh, and whatever opportunity you get to actually absorb the draft and to take in the testimony that we just heard from Will White, And then we will find a time to return to have committee discussion because it, that's really what is required for people to have a chance to look at things. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, there, there is, you know, we, we've, and I have had some conversation with, as I said uh, earlier with uh, Representative Grad and I think that she will understand, particularly after last night, uh, that there may need to be a little bit more time from our, for our committee. Uh, Representative Goldman, you have a... I just have a timing question. Um, when you said after floor, did you mean this morning or that we would come together at 1.15? I just wanted to be clear. clear well, about that. Here, here's, here's what I'm anticipating is that, we, that we'll, we'll take a break now. We'll stop now. We'll go to the floor at 9.30. Uh, if the floor is going, if the floor adjourns before the noon hour, which I don't know if it will or not, you know, I don't, I honestly don't know that anybody has a sense of that at this point. Uh, it could go throughout the entire morning. If it goes throughout the entire morning, then I'm going to suggest that we come back, say, 15 minutes after the floor in the afternoon, but we will not convene at least until uh, 1.30 in the afternoon, because I have a commitment between 1 and 1.30 uh, every Friday. So it wouldn't be early. Am I being clear? So if we adjourn, if we, if, and if we bump up against the noon hour or close to it, we won't try to do anything this morning. But if you check in, if we, if we finish on the floor this morning, if everybody could check in with Colleen, or I'll have Colleen communicate what we're doing. If it's in the afternoon, if we're still on the floor at like say two o'clock, three o'clock, then, uh, well, you know, it's not out of the question. Uh, and plus, oh, so I just, that's the other thing, just an update. Uh, I just, uh, Ann and I just received a com or, uh, communication from the speaker. I believe I'm right in this, Ann, I was trying to do two things at once. That the speaker intends to take up H88 first. S S88. Thank you. I've done that so many times. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Lori. They've been correcting me over and over and over. <laughs> I, I wonder what H88 is. Anyway, uh, S88. Yeah. So uh, the speaker intends to take up S88 first, and so um, that's in our interest, frankly. <laughs> I think, and in Anne's interest, so that can be done. So then we'll check in. We'll check in in the afternoon, and uh, if we're done in the floor before the noon hour, we'll check in again. Does that make sense? That's the best I can say because it's it's just undetermined otherwise. And in the meantime, uh, let's see if you can get a chance to look through the draft. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all.